Hello everyone. I am Bethany with the Puppy Academy. This is Shotzi, right? Isn't she adorable? She's so tiny. I'm going to have to really pay attention to her because she's definitely in her um, I want to chew and nip everything face. <laughs> Isn't she cute? Oh, I'm dying. She's so cute. Okay. Um, this is... <laughs> No, it's right there. Oh, okay. Maybe I should put it up here. Okay. Shotzi, don't go anywhere. Everybody, hang on a second. There we go. All right. All right. Here we go. Now we're ready. All right. So this is episode number 157 of Ask a Puppy Trainer Show. And we have done a special potty training power hour. And then we have another whole big Q&A we're planning with our online school. So if you sign up by Sunday you can be a part of that for, um, again, that is our online puppy training school that you can go to thepuppyacademy.com and sign up for. we got a whole uh, potty training <laughs> extravaganza planned. <laughs> so, so you can check that out there. And I wanted to say, if you guys have, if you guys are live and you guys have comments, please put them down below. I saw someone say, I joined. Is that what I see? Maybe? Okay, cool. Um, if uh, you have questions, please put them down below and I will get to them. I have a million here, but I like to prioritize the people that show up. All right, <laughs> let's get started. Um, starting with uh, Faither. Faither says, nine week old miniature long haired dachshund. Um, five days ago, doing well adjusted. Uh, they need leash help. Constantly when he's out of crate or playpen, he likes to mouth on the leash. He probably, yeah, I mean, this one would do the same thing. They're about the same age. Shotzi's not much older. You're dunk out. Um, <laughs> tends to favor canvas cloth toys, but um, I think that he's too young. So sorry, I'm not completely following this. Sometimes it's hard, you know, it's, it's hard to ask questions and get all the information. It's not aggressive. If this is correct, what age should we start correcting or diverting from this? I'm guessing you mean chewing on the leash. Okay, so for me, for a puppy that's nine weeks old, you know, my question is first, how are you guys using the leash? Because if you're, it, it can get confusing. If you're using, oh, do I taste delicious? If you're using the leash, to like try to get them to go outside, to try to get them to come here. I, I wouldn't do that with a nine week old. I mean, I would only use the leash to prevent hiding, to prevent flight, to prevent going somewhere else. I would use it to stop that, but I would always have food on me and be doing food training to get them to give into the leash pressure if they're pulling away from me. And then getting in the habit of going from point A to point B, it's like, puppy, let's go, and using food and no leash pressure. They don't understand leash pressure when they're young, and so it becomes very frustrating to them, and they'll be more likely to mouth, more likely to put the brakes on and things like that. Now, if it's a dog like Shotzi, and they're just hanging out next to me in the floor and I have my puppy dragging around a leash. I'm like stepping on the end of it or holding the end of it so they can't get into things um, and they can't get too far away from me and have an accident. That's what we always suggest people do if they want their puppies out with them. If that's the case and they're chewing on it, I do just redirect them. I might be like, hey, no, and then look at this toy. <laughs> I think he said he likes canvas toys, you know, to chew on. Um, I would, I would personally kind of stick with firmer chew toys, not the kind that you can shred, cl not cloth toys that they can like rip apart. I would probably stick with um, firmer types of toys or Kongs that you can put their food or just a little bit of peanut butter in that they can lick out, like something like that to redirect them to. And if you're actively working with them, so there's, see there's all these segments, okay? So there's the one if you're accidentally doing leash pressure, there's the one if they're doing it on their own and they're just hanging out, yes, I would just redirect them. But if I'm working with a puppy 
and they keep going for the leash over and over and over again. And I'm not using the leash. The leash is not tight. The leash is not being pulled taut in any way. They just keep going for it rather than the, the food. Then yeah, I might give it like a little tug or just do a little <laughs> with a dog this size. It's like a little gentle leash pressure <laughs> up in the air, just a little bit, just to be like, you know, no, cut it out. And look here, I have food, refocus on food. Um, that could be a strategy that you could go as well. What? Wow. Did you hear that demanding growl? Do you have something to say to me? I think she's tired of being held and, and she's incredibly cute. So she might be the tiniest bit spoiled. Really? Is, is that so? Is that how it's going to be? Well, oh, nope, nope. See, I can tell a really young puppy. No, no. Cut it out. Then you need to pause. And then you need to redirect them to something else. So I don't expect that no for, I think she was starting to mess with my mic. She's getting frustrated doing nothing and being held. Um, I don't expect that no to continue to last through this 30 minutes of don't touch my mic. She's a puppy. I've, I've got three to five seconds if I'm lucky. You know, right now she's, she's thinking, hmm. Well, then what else can I do? Oh, there's nothing else I could, that I can do. I'm going back for the mic. So my point is, you know, talking with the, about the docs and with the leash is that if you can say no, you can do a little no, make it mild, pause, firm, be clear, your energy clear, pause, redirect to something else. Because if you don't, of course, the puppy's going to go back to the leash immediately. And then every time you let them out of crate, you're going to have to do the whole cycle again. That's, that's normal. That's part of it. Okay. I'm going to give this little stinker to you before she does go for my mic again. And I don't notice it. Uh Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. Cutie pie. <laughs> She's so cute. All right. Now I can focus. That was too much cuteness. This is one of the cutest puppies we've ever had on here. The, one of the youngest, cutest. And I, I couldn't even truly focus. Okay. <laughs> Kendall says, I'm getting a puppy. Um, I work eight hour shifts. How should I take care of the puppy when I'm not home? Hi, Kendall. Uh, we, we have answered this question so much in the last month. I really feel like every week we have deep dived into this. So I'm, I'm sorry if um, this is uh, kind of the same thing you guys have been hearing if, if you're regulars on here. But you could look at some past episodes and, and we always put the questions and the timestamps um, in the information part on YouTube. You get the full length videos because uh, I am going to kind of give you a bit of a shorter version because I feel like we've really beaten that home the last few weeks. Uh, the short version is you have to get help unless you're doing, unless it's like an outside dog, unless it's an outside dog that's going to be uh, spending most of its day outside. If that's the case, the protocol is different. You want to do a very safe outside pen that has a covering that like a hawk or something can't get into. And it needs to be, you know, safety and, and all of that. And they learn to potty in this area and then they don't go in this area because it's a huge, you know, kennel type pen. Um, all of that is a little bit different than training, you know, a puppy to be in the house with you. I personally, a puppy in the, in the house eight hours a day without a break, you, you are going to run into a lot of issues. So it, not even now, like down the road, potty training, behavioral issues, things like that. And I'm not saying nobody's ever done it and been successful. I'm just saying that it's, it's very, very hard and, and, um, yeah, it's just not great. So, <laughs> so, um, you want to get a Rover or someone to at least come out midday and let the puppy out for a potty break and maybe a little bit of play. I wouldn't try to do, you know, a, a walk or anything like that with a young puppy. But if you live in an area where you can just get Rover or a dog walker or something like that to pop over, um, for an eight hour shift, you would want two times if you can, you definitely can't do a standard crate training. So your potty training is going to take a lot longer, but stick to that schedule when you're home of crate training, crate rotation and treat, you know, and training, potty training. And, uh, for me personally, if I was really, you know, stuck, like, let's say I couldn't get a Rover or a dog walker, or I could only afford it once a day. Cause it's not the cheapest in the world. Um, understandably, you know, cause they're driving around going to your house. I would also, I would be like, okay, at 10 AM is the Rover. And then at 2 PM, my, you know, 15 year old neighbor is home and, and they're going to, and he's going to come over and just let the dog in the backyard to pee and play with him for a minute and put him back. And so you're going to want some kind of rotation like that and make sure they're in a space that's very safe 
for them that they can't get out of. Honestly, I love giant crates <laughs> for situations like this. Um, I think play pens with a lot of breeds doesn't work very well. You can spend money and do like the puppy apartment. And this is only because, you know, you're not going to be able to do standard potty training, but you just need an area big enough to where it's like go potty over here. And then there's a small area over here where, um, you don't have puppy pads or you don't have, you know, something like that for the puppy. Okay. Anyway, I know I said I'd make it short. That's the short version. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Adresel says we're traveling away for three weeks. What do you recommend? Seven month old puppy. He's doing very well sleeping in his crate. Um, do you mean like for boarding? or someone coming over to the house to watch him or traveling with him. If you're traveling with him, everything should travel with you. Your crate, like don't get rid of crate habits because you travel and don't go get a cloth crate. They're going to destroy it. So everything stays exactly the same if you're talking about traveling with your puppy. Okay, um, I know that I had one over here, but I don't have a phone today because we're missing Sparky. So I'm just gonna scroll. Yeah, you're traveling with him. Okay, traveling with him, then yeah, that's what you want to do. Just keep everything as close as the same as possible. Where did my where did my question go? <laughs> oh my gosh, there's so so many people have joined. I've like missed my TikTok question. Oh, here we go. Okay. On TikTok, we got a question. I don't know if it's a puppy or not. I need age and breed, guys, if you can. And it says, uh, my puppy, my dog, my puppy gets tired of playing fetch and uh, makes me bring it to him. Well, he's training you. <laughs> Way to go, puppy. <laughs> and so what you want to do is you just stop. <laughs> you stop playing before they get that tired. And you don't want to play with your dogs until they're mentally or physically exhausted anyway. Now, your dog may not be exhausted and just be playing a game with you. That's very possible too. Um, I actually have a, a border calling mix right now that, that does that. And so what I would suggest is that when they kind of go and get it, but they don't bring it all the way to you, is use the long lead and uh, try to encourage them like, break, get it, get it, break, break. Don't go over to them. See if you can get them to pick it up again. As soon as they get it into their mouth, good boy, come gentle pulling of the leash just to kind of try to get him to walk your way with the toy in his mouth. And if he drops it, you use the leash to get the puppy all the way to you, sit good. Then you go out with the puppy, get the toy, but don't give it to him. Come all the way back to the spot where you started and do, uh, don't, it's like stop throwing it, you know, do sh really short throws. Uh, probably start with just tug and drop it if I was having an issue like that, but I would just toss it a foot. Good, come, drop it, sit, break a foot. Like, like I'm just, just a, a lob, okay? Stop throwing it and, uh, and uh, make sure your puppy's not getting too tired. All right, I have a question on here that I really wanted to go over. So. This question is in response to our video talking about what to do with a really anxious adolescent dog when they're outside of crate. It's like, you know, keep them on leash, really show them what to do when they're out of crate or out of a playpen or outside kennel, whatever it is you're using, really teach them what you want them to do when they're in the house with you. And this said, my trainer suggested tethering my 11 week old lab to me. Now it's basically been a game of who's got the stronger will. I'm not backing down. Am I doing it right? Okay. First of all, I like your attitude. You're going to be a good dog trainer. Second of all, the response you gave me makes me a little hesitant though. And uh, I'll tell you why. When you say it's become a, it's like a battle of wills. I'm not backing down. The puppy's only 11 weeks old, not five, six months old. If you had a five, six month old puppy, a retriever, I mean, I totally get it. But 11 weeks, this is really still a baby baby. And there shouldn't be, I, I don't want to say shouldn't be because I don't know you and I don't know how challenging and willful your puppy is. But for me, when I hear 11 week old puppy and uh, I think you need to be building a relationship with him, not creating frustration. Okay. Cause that's what you're doing. If you, if you're saying you're trying to outwill 
the puppy, there's a lot of frustration happening. And as the puppy gets to be more of an adolescent, I, t I totally get that. There definitely needs to be some of those conversations. That's why I said you're going to be a good dog trainer of your dog. But when they're a puppy puppy, it's more about molding and shaping and engaging and showing and experiencing and all the fluffy fun stuff before it all gets rough. <laughs> all right. In adolescence. And so for me, I'm wondering what is so tough about the situation that you, you feel that way because it sounds like you need a firmer crate schedule, crate rotation schedule. It is okay for puppies to spend more time in their crate. And then when he is out with you, uh, that you are mentally and physically tiring him out. I feel like there is a, an accidental shift, especially with retrievers to really go after the body. It's like fetch and maybe fast food work that's, that's like fun puppy style. Maybe you really need to slow things down and you have food on you, but the way that you're delivering it is not eliciting excitement. It's, it's reinforcing calming behaviors. And then when it comes to fetch, you're doing a lot of brain work with the fetch. Fetch is great, but it's hunting and that's what you have. You have a hunting dog, not a dog that that's supposed to hunt down and kill, but a dog that's supposed to hunt down and retrieve. But it's still that, that same brain of like that adrenaline, like they, they want that adrenaline. And so if they're not getting it in some way, um, they, they could be finding it in other ways, which might be what's making him so challenging is he's like, I need to do more things. But if you're over exhausting the body and not the brain, you get so much frustration. So what do I mean by that? I'm working on drop it right away. An 11 week old waits till I put the food bowl down before they get it. I don't need a command. I don't need stay, wait, place. Even though we teach all of that in our online school where you also get one-on-one -on -one help, uh, you, um, shameless plug. <laughs> um, I'm just talking about like just lifting the bowl. And when I put the bowl down and the puppy gets up, I lift it up again or I shut the door. It's easier to teach this with crate to start with. Put the bowl down, puppy gets up, lift it back up, stand up, wait till the puppy pauses. It calms down, right? That's why crate's easier to do that with, but I don't need a command. And then when the puppy's finally calm, then I give it to them. Same with the door, thresholds, in, uh, front door, back door, bedroom door. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is, um, you know, I don't want you to battle it out with your puppy. Uh, I want you to find other ways to set, uh, teach impulse control that aren't related to him just sitting there being tethered to you and wanting to get at things and not being able to. Uh, and I want there to be a lot of food work, but I don't necessarily mean excitement based. In fact, I probably, I don't know your dog specifically, but I probably mean the opposite of excitement based motivating your dog. Sure. But really teaching him, uh, reinforcing calm behaviors. And, uh, and yeah, it sounds like you might have a tricky situation that we might need more problem solving for. So feel free to respond back and we'll prioritize your question. Cause I think this is a good one and just don't quite have enough information. Now I will say this though, if your puppy is going to be out with you in your home, I do agree that they need to be tethered to you in some way. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that because I'm going to go down so many rabbit holes of trying to get to the heart of your question when I don't have enough specifics. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Cold. Re really? Really? You're going to make me say this? Cold fart says, really? How old are you? I mean, come on. I see a photo of you with a dog. No, I'm just, I'm just teasing. You must have a really great sense of humor and you're making me pay for it. Thank you. Okay. Cold fart says, how do I teach my dog not to bite the leash? 13 week old golden retriever. Um, it's really kind of funny that you say that. So I talked about that a little bit. That was the first question that popped up. And so when this, uh, gets reposted, it'll be the first question. So make sure you check our feed tomorrow or the next day and, uh, and listen to that. Cause I'm going to give you kind of the shorter version just because I already went into that earlier. Uh, I would just say 13 week old golden retriever, make sure you've got food on you when your puppy is out with you. So that way it's about engaging with food and teaching commands. And also a 13 week old, you cannot use the leash to like manipulate what he's doing. He doesn't understand the leash yet. You have to actually teach what leash pressure means, how to give into it. And so, um, make sure you're not accidentally pulling on the leash. 
uh, when you're training and you don't even realize it, okay? The leash is just there to prevent the puppy from going somewhere you don't want them to go. And then the food and the guidance and the relationship you're building is there to get him out of those predicaments, to get him to come over to you rather than you know pulled away. Now, if he's just hanging out, chewing on the leash, totally normal, you need to redirect him. You can say no, you can be like, no, hey, cut it out. But you then, within three to five seconds, you have to then give him something else to do, okay? All right, um, and he might just be too excited to be out on leash at that time, being calm. You know, I don't know when he's chewing the leash. I think that's part of the problem. And so, uh, you know, feel free to respond back with that. But uh, those are some, some tidbits. If, if, he's, if you're expecting him to just hang out and not chew on the leash, it might be too much to ask of him at this age. Okay, Sammy says, six-month-old Pomeranian keeps barking at people when going on a walk, then whines after they walk by. Okay, six-month-old Pomeranian. So they're st so that's very typical for the breed. They are very uh, territorial. They're meant to run around castles and bark at everything and chase off, chase off small, smaller critters um, back forever, you know, 100 years ago. And you have to take that into consideration about them. They're very boisterous little dogs. But it doesn't mean that we let them get away with that. It's we want to show them, you know, oh, it's no big deal. You know, cut it out, follow me. And then for in the house and then on a walk, we don't bark at things, period. And so how you start shaping that for me is, does your puppy understand leash pressure? Meaning, if your puppy's just sniffing, can you do a little bit of sideways? This is a small dog, so definitely arm straight, sideways leash pressure. And does your dog easily turn and follow you? If not, that's what you need to be working on first. Also, is your puppy food motivated? Six month old Pomeranian, I would definitely wanna build some food drive if possible. However, when they're having a barking fit, they're already over threshold. You've already missed your teaching moment. So you're just in management mode. So a six month old, even a little dog, I might just give a little pop of the leash like, hey, come on, let's go. Really confident turn and walk. But that is just managing the arousal. It's not teaching, usually, unless they're crazy sensitive. It's not usually teaching. And so what I want you to do is the next time you see a person way down the street and you look, then you check in with your dog immediately and those ears are always up, but you kind of see a stiffness, you kind of see a change, and they kind of focus a little bit more. Maybe they go stiff, maybe they walk a few steps ahead, those eyes and ears are lasered forward, that's your teaching moment. They are still able to learn from you before they've reacted. So that's when you want to start teaching them what to do instead. And it's going to be a let's go, turn and walk, stop, sit, food, three steps, stop, sit, food. If they won't take food, you're a little bit too over threshold for food, you just lead with leadership. Let's go, we're out of here. Do a 180, start walking until the puppy isn't fighting you on like, oh, but I don't want to see the person anymore. Then cross the street. Then work on your obedience at a distance from the person walking by. That's where you start to build that bubble of tolerance and expectation uh, of the dog. So you're doing a combination of things. You're building confidence. You're showing leadership. You're, um, I, it's not just redirecting. You are actually interrupting them in the moment in the cycle of arousal so that's kind of like a no then follow me you're building confidence when you go across the street and teaching them what you want them to do instead okay uh <laughs> thank you you're welcome all right vane says my one-year-old schnoodle has a meltdown when he sees other dogs on our walk he bites whatever is near all right vane um one-year-old is a full-blown adolescent we often see a lot of issues when, when dogs get to be that age, they get very confused. I don't know what his early learning process was like, but uh, you're going to need one-on-one -on -one help. Um, if you just said a little bit of reactivity, we have tons of tips for that. But when you start to say biting everything that is near, you, you, uh, when you start to try to address that behavior, and it needs to be addressed firmly, you are very likely uh, going to be in the fray of that redirection and you're going to need a balanced trainer to guide you through it, walk you through it. Um, just make sure it's twofold. It's not only addressing arousal before it gets to be that big and boisterous. You gotta learn how to address arousal before it gets to that point. You have to learn how to de-escalate the dog calmly, like not correction-based when it gets to the frantic point 
and you need to learn how to do things in the home that are leadership based that build a better relationship with your dog or they they trust you more to advocate for them they trust that you'll control the environment rather than them feeling like they're in the center like the world revolves around them so they have to address everything they're feeding off of everything and fourth thing is um you know where's the fun you got to learn how to learn how to have fun with your dog structured fun as well whether that's structured food work play you know with a good drop it and waiting to go get the toy till you give permission like there's there's a there's a lot that comes into owning a dog sometimes i say sometimes because sometimes people have it really easy and then other times they don't this is definitely one of the the not easy ones unfortunately and so you're gonna need some one-on-one -on -one guidance for that okay Madison says, 11 month old mini Labradoodle barks at strangers when they try to engage with her on the walks or at the park. She's fine with people walking by. How should I socialize her more with other people? So um, I could have easily skipped this one because uh, I've got like more like puppy puppy questions that I definitely wanted to get to. But the reason I did not because I just glanced at yours, Madison, and I was like, oh, I wanna sink my teeth into this one. Um, the reason why is because I'm going to make it simple because I can't go into it too in depth on here. I'm sorry, but you, you, we don't have to do anything. She's your dog, but I would say you have to stop letting her environment engage with her. You're, she feels so stressed. She's, she knows that you won't stop anything in her path. So if a car is about to run her over, mom's going to let it. If a person's about to come into my space, mom's going to let it. If an off-leash dog that's aggressive is going to come into my space, mom's going to let it. Now that might sound really severe to you, like crazy. That probably sounds crazy to you, but that's how she feels. So from her perspective, if she is uncomfortable with people coming into her space when she's on leash, um, or just in general, you said the park, so I don't know if that's off-leash, but if she's uncomfortable with that, in her head, you have no control over the environment. And so lots of things could startle her. A dog could bark at her tomorrow, startle her, and now she's barking at dogs because she knows you won't stop it. And this is a really common thing that a lot of people uh, accidentally get pulled into because they think they need to meet everybody on a walk and it's the opposite. I don't know where that, it started with that whole thing of meet a hundred people when your dog is, when you first get your dog for the first few months, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, that should be done in a controlled environment in your home, in someone else's home, in a very controlled, positive way. Out on a walk, that should not happen. It's very unnatural to a dog. And so it's honestly not your dog's fault. And it's, it's a predisposition that they have and it's been exacerbated and she's more reactive now because she's like, I'm on leash, I have nowhere to go and this person's coming into my space and people don't listen to dog behavior anymore. They're rude. They look at a dog right in the eye and they go towards them and then they have a reaction and then the dog and then maybe the person backs off. Maybe they don't know what they're looking at and they, oh, it's okay. So to that dog's brain, people don't understand behavior and they're not respectful and they don't respect her and they don't understand anything about animals. So it's your job when you're walking and you're like, oh yeah, I got this cute Labradoodle puppy and someone bends over at the waist and is like, ah, and you go, oh, sorry, um, we're training. And you have a physical movement forward. You step forward, you lean in front of your dog. Like there's a physical movement to make someone who's like bending over step up. Even someone who's just looking at your dog, that is a lot of pressure for animals. They see it, it's actually for people too. You, you don't like walking down the street and you're like, oh man, that person's staring at me. We don't like it either, <laughs> but yet we expect it to be okay with these dogs and some of them just aren't okay with it. And so even if I see someone eyeballing, I'll immediately kind of put myself in between me and them, or if they're coming right at us and I'm stopped, I'll lean in front of my dog, step forward and be like, and, and be like oh, hi make them look up, you know? And then when they look back down, oh yeah, we're training. Yeah, we're not doing any affection. We're training her. And so that would be my biggest suggestion. And then the setup, and then to set up really positive interactions in the home much more slowly at her pace when she's comfortable, where there's no pressure being put on her. Okie dokie. All right, let me squeeze in some of these. I can do it. I can do it. I got 60 seconds. 
Um, some of these baby ones. Uh, I just adopted Grass. It says nine week old puppy. We're in a high rise apartment. She can't go outside till vaccinated. We're using puppy pads inside. Crate training. Uh, sorry, I'm just, it's a lot. 20 minutes. Extremely excited. Runs around and pees in the random spot. I redirect her, take her to the pee pad, say go potty. Yeah, that's, that's not, it's not that that's not going to work, but that's not going to work. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so what's happening is she eats and drinks 20 minutes. She gets too excited. She runs around and she's not peeing where you want her to pee. So, so I understand your idea of like, oh, she's already peed, but let me take her back to the spot to show her where I want her to pee. She doesn't know what it means yet. So, so unfortunately you're just building bad habits while you're trying to teach her go potty. So you have got to get some sort of play pen. And it needs to some sort of, um, you can get just like a fold up cheap fence. I think they're cheap. <laughs> I've had mine for so long on Amazon and just go around like three puppy pads. And so you invite her out of crate first thing in the morning, I would probably scoop her up and then I would put her in there. And then if you get a fancy playpen with like a door throughout the day, you can make her stop and wait at the door, go potty. But when she's really excited or especially first thing in the morning, you're just going to put her in there. And so she can't miss. She's surrounded by puppy pads. She can't miss. That's the key to potty, to potty training on puppy pads is everything is puppy pads where they hang out, right? And then in three to four weeks, you remove one puppy pad and then see if she, you know, congregates to the other puppy pads that are out. In two weeks, remove another. In two weeks, remove another. Oh, she had an accident. Put it back. She's not ready yet. So that's how you facilitate that. Okay, one more. I'm squeezing it in. Uh, four month old. Is it too late to crate train a cockapoo who's sleeping in the bed with her mama? She's jumping out of the bed. I don't want her getting hurt. Erica, it's never too late, but that doesn't mean it will be easy. Um, I would try her in the same room as you on the first night. And if it's horrible, do you have a room in the house where you can just put her and she can kind of just cry it out, okay? And I know that sounds rough, it's, it's, but it's, it's not a baby. It's not like we're leaving a baby to cry. It's, it's different. It's uh, one of those things where they don't really work through any sort of rationalization and they're developing this attachment to you that's really hardcore. And if you are there with her, it might make it harder. But I would try that first. But if you just put her in a room and uh, by herself where you can't hear her and you can, you can hear maybe barking, but just not a little whining. She'll get tired. She'll go to sleep and she'll get used to it. And then when she gets a little older, you might be able to move her back in the room with you, the crate. Um, but I wouldn't just put her in a crate. I would go on YouTube. You can check out our online school if that's something you're interested in, a whole program. And really look at how to introduce the crate. Two things, how to introduce the, introduce the crate positively, how to teach house, we call it house, how to teach crate how to teach them, this is the big one, from day, from day one, how to wait for permission to come out of crate using the crate door as leverage. And so you do all of those things and she sleeps in it tonight. Even if she's not walking in on her own with food, she sleeps in it tonight. And, but you keep building those positive associations and keeping it part of your everyday routine. And let us know how it goes and we can go from there. All right, guys, I hope you got lots of information today and uh, I'll see you same time, same place next week. Bye.